just jump in and we'll pray over the message. Okay? Father God, I thank you so much for everyone here this morning. I pray, Father, that you would send forth the power of your Holy Spirit. Come and prepare our hearts for the word you have for us today, Lord. I pray for anyone that watches this video online. I pray for uh, just everyone in our community, in our families, in our, in, our, in our work life, in our ministries, Lord, that you would come and do a brand new thing, Father. As we come out of the winter into the spring, you're bringing forth new life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 All right, well, if you're taking notes this morning, the, the, the message is the power of the testimony. And I felt like this whole morning, all we've done is shared testimonies. So how timely. So um, I want to give you an update super quick. I just kind of shared a little bit of you got with you guys about what's going on with the ministry that God's given me. And... Uh, <laughs> As you know, I mail out newsletters every three months, and I always share whatever God's put in my heart and or whatever's going on, and I've been doing this for over five years, and over the last year, there's been an explosion of growth. So I bet in the last year, my, my mailing list has probably doubled, if not more, in size. And same thing with my emails that I send out every week. And so, um, so I just want to share with you guys that, that now, I send out emails and mail and uh, newsletters to all 50 states. Oh, nice Delaware, Kansas, California, Florida, New York, Maine, uh, Montana. And now I have a handful of people in Canada. Wow. So, so it, it, it's unreal because I said from the beginning, Lord, I want a global ministry. And it, you know, in Albany, Texas, building a global ministry. And you say it at first, but then when it kind of starts to happen, you go, whoa. <laughs> but and there's a principle here, too. Sometimes things take time. How many of you know if you have a big dream, it might take a little longer? You know what I mean? So I've had to do, I mean, there's a perseverance. There's a character development that happens. Because I've been doing this for half a decade now. And it was like in the fifth year is when I saw things really break out more. So, so I'm excited. I want to share that with you guys. And, and uh, I've had a lot of people that donate because I use donations to uh, use ads that target people that are interested. And it's very effective. And so, and also to help with the mailing out and that sort of stuff. So, so thank you for you guys that have given. And uh, you're, you're already bearing fruit for the kingdom. So, um, and also, I've just finished another chapter of my new book about Israel. And so, I don't know when it's going to be done. It's taking longer than I want it to. But God, he's been around a whole lot longer than I do. I have, so, like, a day for me is, like, forever. A day for him is, like, a millisecond. So, uh, so anyways, keep that in your prayers because... There's been a lot of warfare going on, a lot of warfare, a lot of resistance from the enemy trying to get me off course. So just keep that in your prayers because how many of you know the devil hates Israel? He hates Israel. He does. And he hates the church that was birthed out of Israel. So, so we need to be standing with Israel. We need to be praying for Israel now more than ever. And the promise is that God's going to bless you as you stand with Israel. The, the nation he chose to display his glory Amen. that has gone to the world. So, and uh, I want to share with you a couple of, of testimonies because today I'm talking about testimonies. Uh, I got a couple of emails. There's this really sweet girl named Judith. I talked about her last uh, time I preached in January, and it's surreal. She's 20 something and she found some of my ministry stuff through, I guess, online, I guess, Facebook. And I started my faith fundraiser. Well, someone just donated some money on my fundraiser. I had no idea who it was. I didn't even know if it was a real person. Well, then I finally found out her name's Judith. And Judith will be watching. Hi, Judith. And uh, anyway, she's given every month faithfully. And so she supports me every week. She emails and says, thank you for sharing Word of the Week. And I mean, it's just been this incredible relationship of the kingdom divine relationship and she uh, wrote me 
the day I preached on magnifying your faith. And I'm going to read to you what she wrote me. She said, I want to share, hello, McCain, I want to share my testimony. It's like crazy, seriously, because I don't know how to say it or show it. I was really surprised when I saw you with a magnifying glass. Y'all remember the magnifying glass I had? She said, she said, my eyes almost popped out of my head because recently I was at the stationery store and I guess that's what they call the, it, she lives in Cape Verde, an island off Africa, so it's an African country. And she said, uh, I just went in to get myself some, a sticky note because I ran out and my eyes caught this magnifying glass in the store. She said, I just stood there looking at it. And the more I looked at it, I fell in love with it and I felt my spirit to buy it. But I was confused because I didn't need a magnifying glass for anything and I couldn't understand why I was feeling the way, why I was feeling that way as I was just staring at it. And my girlfriend noticed my distress and she asked me what the problem was. I told her that I felt my spirit to buy the magnifying glass. Then my friend told me not to buy it because I sounded crazy. <laughs> she said, but I couldn't stop myself, so I bought my magnifying glass, even though I thought too felt it was crazy. She said, I didn't understand it at all, but now after your live video or your sermon on magnifying your faith, I don't feel crazy anymore, and I can't wait to tell my friend. Is that not? You know, I've never brought, I don't usually bring props. You know, my hair, maybe you can consider a prop, but you know, it's always doing its own thing. But anyway, uh, so, you know, wow, God, right? Someone all the way in an African country bought a magnifying glass, and I brought a magnifying glass to church. You don't even know what I'm preaching about. How many of you know we're all interconnected? There's one global church, and we're all interconnected through the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pretty cool. Okay, and then so she writes me the next day, and I knew she was going through a hard time because she'd been telling me a few weeks before, pray for my grandma, pray for her. She's in the hospital. And then she had passed away, I think, the week before. And she said... Uh, the next day, she emailed me again, and she said, um, I kind of passed out on the news of my grandma, which made me hurt my back. She thought it was broke, or she said my spine or whatever, because I'm not sure. I never went to the hospital or doctor to find out, because, and my back was hurting really bad. I just wanted you to know that I'm one of those people you prayed for about back pain. Remember when I prayed over ligaments and joints and neck and back? She said, and I just, I'm one of those people you prayed about back pain. And I want you to know that I've received my healing. I'm all pain-free. And this is cute. She said, I no longer walk around like gingerbread, man. <laughs> so I, I, I wrote her back and said, praise the Lord. And I told her, you know, there's someone else, Kay. She that, she, when I prayed for the healing, your joints and ligaments. So, you know, I was just like, what? <laughs> you know, is this, you know, Judith is one of those people that's out of this world. You go, is this a real person? This is just wild, right? And so what I'm saying is when you share, you don't know who you're going to touch. And now we live in this media saturated culture. You post something online or an email or whatever, a phone call, you can connect with anyone around the world. It's just far out. So I just want to encourage you guys to release your faith because things like this can be a normal thing in every Christian's life. Our natural lives are supposed to be supernatural. Amen? The, the, the Christian walk is exciting. And so today I'm talking about the power of our story. You know, have you ever heard that history is his story? God has always been in charge and control of history and time. And so we can trust him with whatever it is we're going through. And um, I, I, I want to share, just to define testimony, because I'm talking about the power of our testimony. And I think I've read this definition to you guys before, but it says a, a testimony in a court of law is a formal written or spoken statement, especially one given in a court of law. How many of you know... Uh, you have to share. In order for God to be glorified, you don't hide it. You don't just, oh, sometimes God will tell you to keep stuff to yourself, but a lot of times God wants you to open your mouth and speak it or to write it. I know a few of you like to write, and I, I believe today is a call for you to keep writing. Some of you like to speak, and today is a call for you to keep talking because that's what's going to draw people to the Lord. Okay? 
So another definition of testimony is evidence or proof provided by the existence or appearance of something. And, and the obvious one in the context of church is a public recounting of a religious conversion or experience. So that's kind of the definition of the testimony. Okay? And I wrote, we need to always be sharing what God is doing because that's what stirs up faith, gives God glory, and opens the door for more acts of God in our lives. Because what happens when you're sharing about the Lord, what happens is faith begins to stir whoever's listening. And how many of you know that faith is an atmosphere for signs, wonders, and miracles? Jesus said, there's an accounting, Jesus did all sorts of miracles, but there, his own hometown, he didn't do hardly anything. You want to know why? There was no faith. This is just the carpenter's son. We know him. Fami you ever heard the term familiarity breeds contempt? You know, they're just from Albany. They're just from wherever, my hometown. So, you know, they, they minimize it, what God is doing. But when we share, it breaks disbelief. It breaks that rockiness up and opens the door for faith. And when faith comes, the Spirit of God comes, and that's when the miracles happen, when anything is possible. So that's why we need to be sharing our testimonies, our stories. And, and so today I want to talk, live your faith out loud. When I was in Hollywood, I'd go to these acting classes, and they would say, one of these acting coaches, she was, she was a mess, but she had some wisdom. <laughs> and she said, as an actor, you're living out loud. You ever watch TV or a movie? People, it's dramatic. It's, you know, you feel the feelings, the sights, the sounds, you know, the story. They're building up the story of the movie. And in the same way, God wants us living out loud whatever it is we're going through. The good, the bad, the ugly. You know, we need to be sharing what's going on. I have a prophetic word with Janet and Lee, and y'all said your life is like an onion. You know, you're peeling back the layers of the onion and the tears, but the Lord says to share what you're going through because then people are going to see that God is real through you. So um, I want to jump into Matthew chapter 5 real quick. These are probably pretty familiar verses, but just about this living out loud, okay? So Matthew chapter 5, verse, starting at verse 14. Okay. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So what that tells me right there is we need to be living in a way that people can see what God is doing. And it's not just to bring attention to self. That's not what, it, you know, we're not talking about the Pharisees who went through religious rituals. It's the real stuff. And I had a vision about that I'm going to share in a minute. But the real stuff. And so we have this light in us. Last night I was lying in bed and I've, I've really been dealing with, you know, I've had a lot of anxiety and the Lord said, McKay, quit worrying, quit worrying. Just got a lot going on. And last night I was lying in bed and, you know, have you ever been lying in bed and you're stressed out and then all of a sudden you start to relax and peaceful? Well, that's what happened to me last night. And I could feel people praying over me. And it was just like, like I could feel the anointing. Like Lee in the car, you know, almost crying. But boys don't cry. I, I didn't cry before you, while you're talking either. And uh, and anyway, so I was lying there, and uh, all of a sudden I felt this peace, this supernatural peace. And all of a sudden, boom! My whole in body felt like light, pure, perfect, pure light. You know, almost like the inside of you that's going to heaven, boom, perfect light. How many of you know we are light? Amen. I was in the parking lot about to get in, and come in here, and uh, and I just started thinking about Janet, and I just, I, I thought, I said, thank you, Janet. You know, what a blessing, because she's how I found Maranatha. So thank you. It's like an inheritance kind of thing, like I inherited this through Janet. 
And I said, oh, I go, oh, Lord, I would be like a tarot reader and talk to the dead people, you know, <laughs> who else would talk to the dead, you know, on the old covenant. And the Lord said, no, 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 no. Janet's even more alive, in a, in a sense, Janet's more alive than even y'all are right now. She's really alive. And Wayne and all these people that have gone before, they're more alive than even us. We're still in the battle. But they're, they're in the land. He said, no, 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 my people are in the land of the living, not the dead. So y'all take heart. I believe that's a word for some of us. We've had a lot of lost loved ones this winter, and I believe the Lord is saying, no, they're not dead. They're in the land of the living. I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. Amen. So take that and rest in that. Okay. And you're going back to the light. Um, I believe... You know, as a believer, we have to remember that that we're called to surrender. We're called to be the sacrifice. We're called to lay down our lives for Christ. We're called to give up everything. Because, because uh, you have to be willing to give up everything to follow Jesus and become who God made you to be. It's like a seed. You know, you have to bury it in the ground, stay in darkness, and it has to germinate. And then it begins to grow and become what it was made to be. In the same way, we have to be willing to die to self so that the dreams, the desires, the passions, the things God's called us to can come alive. Amen. You know, there's been so many times, even if it's good things, did you know it can be idolatry if you're obsessed with it? Yeah. It can be, oh, I'm going to build an orphanage, I'm gonna, and it's, it becomes your obsession, and if God's not in it, then it's more of a, it's an idolatrous thing because it's become above God. But when you die and say, Lord, this is what I want, but I'll do whatever, have your way. And when you do that, you're dying, and the Spirit is coming alive, and it's growing. So, you have to be willing to give it all up. And, and I've, I, I'm going to share a lot of visions, because the Lord speaks to me a lot of times. I call it the movie screen of your mind, you know. Almost like daydreaming. It's like a holy daydreaming is how I describe it. You know, you know, if you've ever seen a movie, when you go to the movies, you have a huge screen, and then behind, up top, there's a projector. And that projector releases light, and then, you know, and then you have the sound speakers, right? In the same way, if we would surrender to the Lord and we're filling our minds with the Spirit, with the Word of God, with praise, what happens is that projector in your mind, the Lord uses it, turns that projector on, and we can begin to see what he wants to show us, like a movie. Yes. So, and that's what a vision is. And so, I had this vision of my body on a pile of wood. It reminded me of Isaac when he was a baby, and Abraham put Isaac on the wood, right? And I'm lying there, and all of a sudden I see this oil coming out of heaven, dripping all over me. <laughs> and then I saw this perfect fire coming out of heaven, but it didn't hurt, thank God. I wasn't burning. I was burning to death, but I wasn't. And it was symbolic. And it, Romans 12, 1. Great verse. Romans 12, 1. It says, uh, you know, I would normally quote this, but I'm with Kay on that one. I'll get it half right. <laughs> Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. You and I are the sacrifice. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb of God and literally died, but our spirit, we have to yield, we have to die to, to this world so that we can live for the Lord. <laughs> so present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So, and, and I looked up, you know, kind of what does oil symbolize? You know, it symbolizes anointing. It symbolizes making things holy. In the Old Testament, they would anoint the priests with oil to set them apart and make them holy for the things of God. And so when the Lord was pouring that oil on me in the vision, he was anointing me. And then the oil helps fire burn, helps the wood catch on fire. And so the Lord was showing me uh, several things I took from that was, uh, how many of you know you cannot earn God's love. You cannot earn the anointing. Yeah. And you certainly cannot earn salvation. Right. It can't be earned. Right. 
As a matter of fact, the best way to get the anointing is rest. Because when I was lying there, I wasn't doing anything. The only thing that's required is belief, faith, right? And sometimes he'll push us along even when we're in disbelief, you know. He'll, he'll push you anyways. But, but I was seeing that because there's no work required. Just surrender. Surrender. And uh, I wrote this because I feel like this is for, for some people because I feel this way sometimes. The world is loud. It's noisy. And sometimes when you get in a group of people, you feel drowned out. Have you ever felt drowned out, like you're with people and you have something on your heart and you can't say it? Because everybody's talking loud and, you know, you just feel drowned out. You feel voiceless. I go through this sometimes because everybody wants to be heard. But I believe right now, this is for somebody, that the word that I felt in my spirit as I was preparing for this morning is, God is giving a voice to the voiceless so that they can share their testimony and testify. Because the devil wants to drown out the church. He wants to drown out you and me when we're trying to share something, you know? Um, you know, I wrote, ever feel like your opinions, your preferences, and your thoughts don't matter to others or even to God? I believe sometimes we even think, oh, God, well, you're God. Well, you have to surrender. We don't get any choices here, you know? And that's not true. You know, God cares about what we care about. He really does. But he wants us surrendered to him. Proverbs 31, 8 through 9 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. Proverbs 31, 8 through 9. And so, uh, I, I feel like some of us, we need to help others speak up. People that are going through something, Amen. you know. It's not just our testimony. It could be someone else's. We see that, hey, we need to grab this person and say, hey, I want to encourage you to share. Let me help you. You know what I mean? Lift other people up, yes. you know. When you lift others up, God will lift you up. I mean, you know, so. And, and Kay, what you were saying about when you give, it'll be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. It's so true. When you, when you give, it's going to come back to you in a greater measure. So. And it's so funny because uh, Clint, when he was sharing, he said, God, open your Bibles to Matthew 12. And guess what I was feeling? When, uh, uh, the Lord showed me, I kept hearing the number 12 in my spirit. Because I was doing my notes and I had scriptures from Matthew 12, Romans 12, which I just shared, and Revelation 12. 12, 12, 12. And then Clint said, Matthew 12, and my jaw hit the floor. And it was even in the same part of everything I was about to talk about. So, I think Clint's like cheating, you know? Like he's, he's cheating. Like he's somehow getting my notes, and he's cheating. I think he goes, like, maybe when I go to the restroom, he goes and looks, and no, I'm just kidding. But it's always cool. Every time I show up, it's like we're all on the same page. Well, I'm not, but y'all are. <laughs> well, Jim, he might be. Yeah. We're on the same page, which is terrifying. <laughs> no, but really, I heard the number 12 in my spirit. And so I started doing a little bit of research about 12. Obviously, throughout the scriptures, you have uh, the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of, of, of Jacob, and the 12 gates of Jerusalem, right? 12, 12, 12. There's 12 months in the year, you know what I mean? And, and the, the calendar we're on January, February, March, that's the Gregorian calendar, the Gentile calendar, and it has 12 months, but also the Hebrew calendar has 12 months. And, and not a, what's even more fascinating about the number 12, 12, I, I looked it up, it says 12 represents perf perfection and authority in the context of government, in God's government. It represents the church and faith in general, divine rule in the government of God. Now think about this number 12. When you read through Israel, if you actually sit there and count, you read Manasseh and Ephraim, and you count Levi, well, then you go, well, that's 13. 
that they called the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim half tribes, right? Half tribes. Half, half makes one. So there's not 13. It preserves 12, even though there's 13, but it's 12. And in the New Testament, what happened? You had the 12 disciples. Well, Judas betrayed Jesus, and so they had to pick another <coughs> apostle. Why did they feel, why didn't they just leave it at 11? Because it's not perfection in the context of God's government. So they picked, they spun the dice or whatever, and they they won the lottery, the jackpot. No, I'm just kidding. The, sorry, I think my sisters are out at the casino. So. <laughs> they're gonna kill me. They're gonna kill me. Yeah, they're gonna kill me. I'm expecting a tithe off those winnings. No, but really, they, they, they said, okay, Lord, who do you want the next apostle to be? And it was Matthias. Everyone say it, Matthias. And so the 12 apostles were preserved, right? right. It's fascinating. That's right. And then in the Old Testament, the way our Bibles are broken up, you have uh, the law, the prophets. Well, you have the major prophets and the minor prophets. There's 12 minor prophets. So you see this principle of 12 throughout the scripture. It's fascinating. And even in the Hebrew calendar, the last month is called Adar. And it's it, the Hebrew calendar is a little different. So every two to three years, they have what's called a leap year. And so it becomes Adar 1 and 2 on leap years. But it's 1 and 2. There's not a 13th month. It's just the same month, just twice as much. But it's still 12 months. So there's this preservation of the 12. And in the same way, I believe the Lord's showing me 12 over and over and over. Because there's some 12s coming to each and every one of your lives. The 12 months of this year, God has already ordained for you. And if there's an area of your life that doesn't feel full, I believe the Lord is bringing wholeness. He's, if you're at 11 and a half, he's make, snapping something and making it 12. He wants you whole in every single area of your life. So, the 12. You're going to hear 12 a lot this upcoming week. 12, 12, 12. All right, now to Revelation 12. If you want to turn to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 12. All right, I'm at Revelation 12, 7. Revelation is a fascinating book, and it's based on visions that God showed John the Apostle when he was on the island of Patmos, suffering for Christ. Nonetheless, he had a lot of visions. Most of it pertains to the end, most, pretty much all of it pertains to the end times. And he's having this vision, and he says in Revelation 12, 7, he says, there was a war in heaven and Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So, you know, ever hear of fallen angels, the demons? him and the devil. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And I love this verse. Here we go, church. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life, even when faced with death. Amen. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. Church, we have got to wake up. We are in a war. The devil has fallen, and he is angry. And the reason he is angry is because he knows he's being beat. So he is now he's not fighting the angels, he's fighting us. 
But the good news is, how do we overcome the devil? The blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. Brothers and sisters, our word of the testimony is power. It destroys the devil. And we do it through the blood of Christ. We don't do it in our own authority. We do it in the perfect blood of the Lamb. And, And it says... The devil and his demons, his fallen angels, were not strong enough for Michael and the angels of God. And if he wasn't strong enough to overthrow God's angels, he's not strong enough to overthrow the church, and he's not strong enough to overthrow God's people. Amen. So the next time you feel like you're losing, say, uh-uh, I am stronger than he is, because I have the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. That's how we overcome the blood and the word. <coughs> Amen? Amen. Have you guys ever heard? Uh, and some of you guys may do this you, when you're praying. You say, "I just plead the blood of the Lamb Amen. over my loved ones." You know, I plead the blood of the Lamb over my finances. I plead the blood of the Lamb over my church, my home. Amen. You're applying that blood because the blood has power. Amen. The blood of Christ has power. And the spoken word has power. Amen. Mm. And, and I looked up a definition, an explanation of the blood, because I like to be precise, you know. And uh, it says uh, the Israelites in the Old Testament would not be protected unless they applied the blood of the Lamb to the door of their homes. You know, in the Passover, when Israel was in Egypt and God was delivering them, God sent an angel of death. And anyone who didn't have the blood over their doorpost of a lamb, they died. You know, the firstborns died. And so, uh, but now it says, uh, you and I cannot be protected unless we apply the blood of Jesus, the true Passover lamb, to our lives. Pleading the blood of Jesus prevents the enemy from the access to your life you would otherwise have. So, Lord, I plead the blood of the Lamb over each and every one of us right now in Jesus' name. I plead the blood of the Lamb over our finances, over our health, over our children, our parents, our siblings, our grandparents. I plead the blood of the Lamb over our businesses, our churches, our ministries, Lord, that the devil has no rights, no authorities in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, now uh, I want everyone to turn to your neighbor and say... We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. A lot of words. And turn to your other neighbor and say, We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Okay, that was muffled, so we're going to do it all together. (laughs) We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. Mm. That's good. So we got the blood of Jesus. Amen. We're pleading the blood. So the second part of that is the word, what we speak. And our words are very powerful. And I have a vision. I think the Lord was reprimanding me. You know, I don't get in trouble very much, but... Okay, okay, all the time. But, but really, what, what words, the heart and the words are all interconnected. Because what's in the heart comes out. And I want to read it to you. And we read Revelation 12, Romans 12. Now we're in Matthew 12. So everybody go back to Matthew 12. 12, 12, 12. It's funny because he, uh, Clint read Matthew 12, 29, and I'm going to read to you 28, I skip 29, and then I read the verses out. So we're like punching holes here. That's great. Man. How many of you know the kingdom of God is fun? It's, a, it's awesome. Perfect love casts out all fear. And I got I to gotta confess, guys, I've had to deal with some fear and I, and, and, and I have to get back to that perfect love. 
So, okay, Matthew 12, and I'm going to read 31 through 37. And Jesus is telling his disciples, and he's also rebuking the Pharisees. He says, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. But blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. And he's rebuking the Pharisees because they're saying you're casting out demons by the ruler of demons. So they're basically blaspheming the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, verse 35. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil tre treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will either be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So our words are extremely powerful, church. Very powerful. In verse 28, uh, just this part, Jesus says, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so we see that even Jesus, the way he cast out demons was by the Holy Spirit. Right? So if we want to see demons leave, we cast it out by the Spirit. Right? And, and, and what I want you to get here is words reveal character. What's coming out of our mouth tells what's going on in here. And you can try to mask it, but whatever's going on here, if you listen, you know what's going on in someone's heart by what you hear. And then you know how to pray and minister. Right? So, and I, I looked up blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which, you know, attributing the works of the Holy Spirit to the devil, but Billy Graham says, he said, refusing to turn to God and accept his forgiveness is the eternal sin. Right? Yeah. So, and, and it, it, rejecting the good news is the eternal sin. So. And, and it's fascinating because, you know, you go, oh my gosh, Lord, I'm held, held account for everything I've said. Well, the good news is God is merciful. He helps us start over. We're a work in progress. But it's fascinating because I got to thinking about this, and Jesus was a literal person, but he never once misspoke. Not once. And he said a lot of stuff, but he never once misspoke. I've never met anyone that's misspoke, not misspoke. Even Tuesdays with Maury. Yeah. <laughs> Did y'all see that? I always thought he was like Father Time Wisdom when I was a little kid. They played in English. <laughs> bad, bad joke. But anyway, Jesus never misspoke. And that's why we look to him to become like him. Amen? And I want to share with you guys a couple of my testimonies. Because a lot of times when we go to church, we think testimony. Well, that's how you accepted Jesus. That's how you came a Christian. Testimony. And it is. But there's also another testimony, which is testifying to whatever's going on in the now, or something God did. So it's both. Right? Because sometimes people, you go to church, what's your testimony? Well, I went up to the altar, they did the altar call, I accepted Christ, da 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 And that's great. But one of the big testimonies I have as an adult was when I finished college, the Great Recession was going on, you know, 20-something, you're lost, being thrown out in the world. And so I went through all these financial setbacks, lost identity, go down the list. It was just a hard few years. And so what happens when you go through all these hardships is you begin to think, God is against me. If you go through enough hard stuff, it can be tempting to think, well, God just, he's my enemy. He's against me. And the devil wants you to think that. But the, the thing that, that really helped me turn my ship around was when I realized, and, knew, and I knew from my childhood, but to actually experience it after you've gone through some really tough stuff, is when I, the day I knew that I knew that I knew that God really, 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 really was for me is when everything changed. It changed everything. And that was the premise, and that's when I wrote my first book, Tasting the Goodness of God. Because I found out he really is good. 
all the time. No matter what you came from, where you've been, what you've done, how long you've been in prison or whatever, how the tenth marriage, God is always good and he's always good when you come to him. Always. We are in a period of grace. God is always good. And, and my testimony is when I really stepped into that, that's when the prophetic dreams I used to have of writing stuff and filming stuff manifested. That revelation. And that's my adulthood testimony. And here I am over six years later building off that one revelation that God is always good. Amen. And, and the same is true for each and every one of you where you have heartache or setback or disappointment, or you even felt like God promised you something and it never happened, God is still always good. Yes. Always. And as a child, I was I remember I was a little kid, and I was in little Tuscola, Texas. A lot of family in Tuscola. Does anybody know where Tuscola is? <laughs> little bitty town right outside of Abilene. And, went to the, let's see, I always get, it was called Gateway Baptist Church, and I always get confused with Friendship Baptist across the street. <laughs> but anyways, they gave the altar call. I was eight, Mackenzie and Megan, they're a little older, and Mackenzie and I actually got saved on the same day, my oldest sister. And she went up, and I was crying, and then I went up, and I was crying, and I gave my life to the Lord, because he gave, you know, you have heaven, you have hell, you're in sin, you're void without Christ. I felt that voidness. Even at eight, I understood. Well, then I became, then, of course, after the service, the pastor, we were in the back room, and he was, are you sure? Da, da, da. And I started crying. I said, I know, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I know I'm eight, but I know what I'm doing. You know? <laughs> and so, so that was my testimony. And, and ever since then, I've been sealed. I belong to him. No matter the good times, the bad times, the bright times, the dark times, the rebellious times, the mission, I'm the full-blown missionary times, every time I've always been his. Nobody, Jesus said, nobody will snatch you out of my hand. And it's been a wild ride since eight years old. And so, and then I think three weeks later, Megan, my other sister, finally came around. <laughs> and then we all got baptized, them and my dad, so I think he was sprinkled, so he decided they better dunk him. <laughs> so we all four got baptized at Victory Baptist Church. <laughs> so, you know, uh, <laughs> so that's my testimony, and I'm sure each and every one of you have a testimony, so maybe you should share that with someone sometime. You know, the first time you met Jesus, it's pretty neat. And I want to share uh, some visions I had real quick. Um, you know, I already told you guys we're in a war. And I'm back at Revelation 12. And, and uh, there's a lot of symbolism in Revelation. Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 12, 17, it says, So the dragon, the devil, was enraged with a woman. And in this story, the woman is... Israel, the literal Jewish people, Israel, because they birthed the male child who's Jesus, right? So the devil hates Israel because they birthed Jesus, right? right? And Jesus is going to sit on the throne that the devil wants to sit on, okay? So the devil was enraged with the woman, Israel, and went off to make war with the rest of her children. That's the church. How many of you know that we're children of Israel? It's deep. All right? That's why we're all interconnected. That's why we pray for Israel. And it says, He went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony, the story of Jesus and what he did for us. The power of the testimony overcomes death. It overcomes the grave. It overcomes everything through Jesus. So that's the power of the testimony. And, and I want you to see here, it says, the dragon was enraged with Israel, so it went off to make war with us. The devil has made declared war on you and me. He is our enemy in the spiritual realm. 
And, you know, I woke up one morning, and this is while I was preparing notes and stuff, and I still wasn't quite there. And I, I opened my eyes, and I looked across the room, and I just saw, it's like I could see the air almost. I don't know how to describe it. It was just different. And I just felt in my heart, I was like, there's literal spirits moving in the air around us. And we can't physically see them, but we can see their influence. That's right. Pretty trippy, right? Woo! Right? <laughs> And, and so those spirits that were up there fighting Michael, they're down here. Amen. You ever go, oh my gosh, that person's crazy. Well, yeah, those demons are... <laughs> That's why they're crazy, right? <laughs> but guess what? We have authority over them. That's right. Jesus could literally see those spirits. That's right. And he effortlessly <laughs> cast them out. He did it effortlessly. And when we're fully in the spirit, it's effortless. Pretty cool. And uh, let me tell you, uh, talking about blaspheming the Holy Spirit, not everyone's going to receive the gospel, and that breaks my heart. They're just not. Second Thessalonians, I'm going to read this real quick. And God is good and merciful, but he's also just. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. It's a little bitty book. And it's talking about the lawless one, the Antichrist. It says, uh, verse 9, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, it says, The one who's coming, the Antichrist, is in accord with the activity of Satan. With all power and signs and false wonders. Church, we're about to see more and more false wonders. You know, sorcery, that kind of stuff. We already see it, but it's gonna get it's gonna amp up more. As before Jesus gets back, it's gonna amp up, and a lot of people are gonna be deceived. Verse 10. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So they rejected the truth. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. And so we see the Lord, he'll eventually turn them over and he'll send that deluding influence on them. We don't always think that way, but it's the truth because it's insulting. God did all these amazing things for us. He loves us so much. But at some point, he's just going to send that deluding influence. So we, we need to be in prayer, church. We need to be in prayer. And I had this vision of a war. I guess it was maybe Wednesday night. And I kept seeing cannons. I was shooting a cannon. It kept going up. And it would land on top of me. And the Lord said, McKay, turn your cannon. <laughs> so I turned it and I shot that way. And I was, the Lord showed me. <laughs> the Lord showed me that that cannon was my words. I was hurting myself with my own words. Yes. You ever speak stuff over yourself you shouldn't speak? Yes. Stop shooting yourself with a cannon. <laughs> Aim the right way. Place the blame on the one who's waging war with you, the dragon. Yes. Right? And then the, the, the night before, I'd had a dream. <laughs> this is terrible. And it looked like the Hunger Games. Isn't that terrible? It, it, was, it was traumatic. It was like, it was friends from my childhood, some cousins of mine, and we were in this all-out war. And I remember three of us were trying to get this person with a knife trying to, and, and it was just warfare. But it was symbolic, just tremendous warfare going on in the spirit. And I believe the Lord allowed me to see that and it, because, because we are in a war right now, you know? And the more you share the kingdom, it, I mean, you've got to pray bigger prayers. I mean, I believe one reason I'm going through the warfare is I'm writing about Israel and newsletters every day are hitting mailboxes all over the country. Amen. As a matter of fact, 
The last two nights, I've had this vision of this dark force, almost like Star Wars, you know? This dark thing coming at me. Well, the first night, I was stupid to take authority over it, and I woke up with a night terror. But last night, I got smarter, and I saw the same vision. And I said, and I asked the Holy Spirit, what is this? And it was coming literally from the northeast. The northeast which ironically I'm writing about the Northeast, my experience in New York, and I've sent a lot of newsletters that way too. So I put my hand out and said, in the Jesus name. And it was like this mirror, and that dark force went this way, and then it went that way. Amen. It scattered. Amen. And I went back, and I slept great last night. <laughs> but we got to pray bigger prayers. Amen. The more you tear that testimony, the devil is going to sit back. And then the last thing, a vision of an air castle and a real castle. And the castle symbolized churches. And you have churches that are full of a lot of hot air. <laughs> and you have churches that are the real deal, the stone, the rock. Yeah. Now think about it. If you really were in a gun war, would you go run into that little air castle with hot air in it? Or would you run into the stone castle? The real thing. And the air castles are about to start being destroyed. Yes. Because if you're in the end times and the devil's getting angrier and angrier, he's going to start shooting more and more and more and more. Yes. He's going to think of everything he can. Yes. And I believe God is about to start tearing down some air castles. Mm -hmm. But the real castles, the real church is going to come forth. Amen. A place people can literally run to for refuge. Amen. Because the air castle, think about it, it's entertainment. Yes. Right? It's fine. Da, 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 but there's no substance. It's held up by hot air. And it's so funny because the next day, well, I'll tell you what I wrote. One is spiritually fortified and a place to run to for refuge. The other is just an entertainment, a place for those who are bored and it cannot stand on the day of battle. That's what I wrote. And then Thursday, after I had the vision, I read an article. <laughs> And here's the title. Kid you not, the day after I saw the air castle and the real castle, it says, David Jeremiah warns the modern church is entertainment-driven, an entertainment-driven social organization afraid of controversy. When I read that and it said entertainment-driven social organization, I thought that's the air castles he's rebuking. Did you know they said millennials, which you wouldn't think this, millennials are tired of entertainment at church, but they want the real stuff, even the controversial. They want the truth, the hard truth. And I believe we're getting there. Amen. You know, as dark gets darker, people are like, okay, what's really the story here? You know what I mean? And I'm not saying you can't have light, you can't have sound, all that stuff, but I am saying you have to be get real with what the truth is. So, and the last thing, our testimony, that's how we're victorious, that's how we overcome and so I believe right now I'm going to declare some things over each and every one of you and I want you to receive it in Jesus name that we're having victory over conflict Amen. we're having victory over debt yes. we're having victory over disease we're having victory over cancer yes. we're having victory over mental yes. illness yes. we're having victory over depression yes. we're having victory over yes. doubt and defeat yes. we're having victory over heartache yes. we're having victory over the past yes. and we're having victory over say something you need victory over yes. victory we're having victory yes. in our workplaces in Jesus' name. Yes. And a prophetic word I got for the church is uh, uh, the, the prophetic word I hear in my spirit for us as men of the fellowship is victory. And I feel like there's been a lot of heartache, a lot of pain, and a lot of loss. But God is bringing us into a new season of healing, breakthrough, restoration, and revelation. And we're going to see new doors open as a church. We are in a time when the last shall be first and the forgotten shall be remembered as the church. Those who haven't had a voice are going to be heard and the power of the testimony is going to be declared. Those who did not think they have a voice will be heard. And I want you to hear this. Your story matters. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Your story, Maranatha Fellowship, matters to God and it matters to other people people to speak what, what God has done is going to do for Maranatha is going to be spoken of 
People are going to hear it, and lives are going to be set free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All righty, guys. Well, I want to pray really quick. Um, just Let's just pray together. And uh, I always give an opportunity for anyone to receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. You may have given your life to Christ, but there could be someone watching. And I want... Uh, there's only one way into heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ, through his yeah. blood. And anyone who doesn't receive forgiveness, there, there's a heaven, there's a hell. And you're going to one or the other. And so the only way to have eternal life is through Jesus. So I want us to pray together as a church to invite Jesus into our hearts as Lord and Savior. And also to consider, you know, when you're talking to someone, the, the Lord may put it on your heart to pray for someone for them to be saved. So that maybe you can pray with them and share the gospel. Okay, so everybody, let's pray together. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes and let's just pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to die on the cross for our sins. I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Amen. You know, I say that on every single solitary one of my weekly Word of the Week gospel videos. And, and it's kind of funny because my whole, you know, I grew up in the church and the most terrifying thing for me wasn't teaching a Bible study. It was saying the prayer of salvation with someone who was meeting Jesus for the first time because it was, it's such a serious thing. It's a heaven and hell matter. And so I felt inadequate. And, and it's funny because now, I don't say I do it effortlessly, but I just do it. And I do it on the gospel videos every single week. You know, and I think the enemy wants us to be terrified to do that. You know? And so I want to encourage you, don't, don't be afraid of that. Because I know I have in my own life, and I'm sure there's someone else that feels, or maybe even you don't feel holy enough. Like, who am I to, I'm not qualified to hear or pray with someone. You know, and it's easy to pray with another believer, but to pray with someone who's believing for the first time is a whole other story. So I just want to encourage you on that. All right, well, I want to declare a blessing really quick. I believe and declare your test is going to be your testimony. You're going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. The Lord is lining up the right people to come across your path and opening doors no man can shut. And I feel this strong. He is breaking any yokes that have weighed you down and setting you free from any shackles of the enemy. You're going to new levels of victory, increase, multiplication, and abundance. Amen. The kingdom of God is abundantly multiplying, church. Amen. You're going to run and not grow weary. You're going to walk and not grow faint. You're going to soar on the wings of eagles. With the Lord's help, there's nothing you can't accomplish. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen. I wanted to share really quick, too, another testimony. I just remembered. There's one more, and I'll be done. Uh, a lady that I know, her name's Gail, and uh, she Facebooked. You know, I talked about magnifying your faith. Well, I did something a little out of the ordinary. I said I was going to get in trouble for it, and I might have. I said I'm going to pray. I talked about the nine... Uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit and uh, speaking in tongues. And I prayed, y'all remember when I prayed in tongues over the microphone? I'm sure I offended some people. <laughs> and someone was, a lady was listening named Gail, and so she wrote me and she said, uh, this is back in January, she said, I listened to your service online. She said, during your message, you spoke directly to a situation I went through and have been going through recently. She said, when you prayed in tongues, I heard in my spirit, come all who are thirsty. So let that, come all who are thirsty. May God continue to bless your ministry. Amen. Amen. That's two gifts. Get to tongues, the interpretation of tongues. Right. Word of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing.